joining us this evening. I think anyone else will follow on and join us later. Um, this is Local Talks. You are, you are, uh, watch, you are, yeah, <laughs> in a Local Talks event. Um, Local Talks started last year. It was initiated by LocalWorks, which is a design and build company based in Uganda. And Local Talks um, is essentially a platform to bring together different people to discuss uh, different topics around green design, architecture, and construction in East Africa. We typically have three talks uh, a year, or th four, talk, four, four talks a year, every third month. Um, and these talks range across a scale from urban planning to building materials, as you will have seen with some of our pre previous talks. And uh, most recently, we looked at a particular building form of the roof a few months ago. Um, and so it has been going well so far. We've really enjoyed the different topics and had great uh, conversations um, started with our audience and with our different speakers. Um, today, we are discussing the topic of e-mobility, which really, I guess, um, is more kind of focused on the idea of green design is where this kind of fits into the category, uh, fits in with local talks. Um, and essentially e-mobility is a technology or a framework that provides kind of eco-friendly transport. And I'm sure our speakers will go into this in more detail and have more knowledge to share with you what this, uh, what this means. Um, so we're quite grateful to have both of them. We have um, Janusz Visaso and Alan Mohumuza. They represent two, co two companies, two different companies. So Jan and Janusz represents um, Bodawak and Alan represents Kira Motors. And yeah, so both of them have experience working with e-mobility in Uganda. And we will get to see exactly, and we'll see, they'll help us to unpack the question we have in our title, which is whether e-mobility is a close reality for us here in Uganda, or if it's something that's just a dream and that can't really be, um, that we cannot see in, in the future happening. So we, yeah, I think essentially Alan um, Samakula that is also here is a director at Local Works, and he is the director responsible for mechanical and electrical engineering. So he will be leading the question and answer session uh, after the two presentations. We will have a presentation from Janusz first, and then Alan will speak afterwards. Um, and so, yeah, I think we'll, we'll leave it at a short introduction so that the speakers can take us into the topics that they know uh, a lot about and they have experience with. Um, so I think, yeah, during this session is being recorded just for your information. It will be uploaded to YouTube later. Um, so feel free to watch it at another time or share it at a different point questions. If you do have questions during the session, feel free to push, put them in the box or um, you can raise your hand and ask them after the both, both speakers. So we'd like the speakers to speak first and then have the question and answer session. And at that point, you can, you're welcome to speak to either, either speaker, both or direct your question as you wish. Um, so I think, yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to Janusz to speak and then Following that, I will introduce Alan as well. Um, Thank you very much, Randy. Uh, I'll also try to keep my presentation brief. Uh, that way, basically, we can get to the question. So I'll share my screen now then. All right. Let's jump back up. There we go. So uh, my name is Janusz Pisasso and I am Chief Operations Officer at Vodavec International Limited. Um, I have a background in mechanical engineering and I had the opportunity to uh, work in both an e-mobility startup, which grew rapidly while I was there from about 30 to 100 employees to um, industrial research institutions where I um, had a chance to uh, dive into several different fields of manufacturing and uh, yeah, um, explore some of the things I truly love. And today I'm uh, on ground in Uganda with the rest of my co-founding team. And um, yes, uh, we're delving into e-mobility among other things at Odavec and I'd like to take you through today. So uh, we're going to be talking about e-mobility in the EAC and we're going to be giving you a brief insight into the energy ecosystem that, is, that we envision. 
So let's start off with the current situation. So one of our major modes of transportation in Uganda is certainly the two-wheeler, the Boda Boda, as it's more commonly known. And um, the total cost of operation for these two-wheelers, um, for their riders, uh, in terms of the petroleum, is roughly 50%, uh, which is quite a big chunk and, of course, uh, deprives them potentially of some further income. Um, it is also responsible for about 2.5% tons of uh, CO2 production per year per motorcycle. So that is a significant amount. <laughs> you uh, can see that we have more than 150,000 units in Kampala alone, and uh, the East African region is probably closer to 3 million. Um, we also have a situation where a lot of us are dependent on agriculture, but uh, a lot of the time in subsistence farming rather than income farming. and. Uh, we only have about 2% um, mechanization in our agriculture. So there's an opportunity even for smallholder farming to um, grow significantly further. Right. So I'll wait for this to load in probably. Yes. Um, so what are we proposing then at Podavec? Uh, in, in, at the core of it, basically, we're trying to develop local solutions. So the, developing the solutions locally, that is for uh, some of the challenges basically that are faced in our local economy here. And um, it seems to be a novel approach because uh, we find that there are a few people doing electronics manufacturing and uh, prototyping and design here on the ground, but uh, we're trying to bring these skills and this know-how into the region because we feel that uh, the knowledge is future-proof and um, yes, you always need to start somewhere essentially. So. Let's look into um, what it is that our approach entails. Uh, so in a pictogram, basically, uh, we are proposing a standardized battery um, with which we basically can uh, be able to serve multiple applications with said same battery. We propose that this battery be smart, and we propose that um, the electronics that make it smart are also produced here locally and designed. So um, seems like uh, a bit of an interesting vision and like it might be hard to explain to a couple of people. And uh, we found that uh, it certainly does require, it certainly does require um, a lot of convincing. So what we've ended up doing is we've ended up uh, trying to prove each and every one of the diagrams present on this slide. So what sort of sectors basically are we serving uh, with that circular economy approach? What are we, what are we trying to do? So the standardized battery that's uh, depicted on the left-hand side. Um, it is basically a 48 volt, uh, 4.6 kilowatt hour battery. So it's 4.6 Yaka units of energy that basically go into filling one of these batteries. Um, that's about 100 kilometers worth of range in a motorcycle. Uh, that's about a third of an acre in a tractor to half of an acre, depending on the quality of soil. Uh, it's about a half week's operation of an electric wheelchair, and uh, it is readily compatible with any 48 volt. Uh, let me say, home power backup systems or off-grid uh, power systems that are currently in the market. Right. Coming uh, to touch on that energy generation and storage aspect slightly further, uh, we certainly have an abundance of renewable energy in Uganda. As a matter of fact, I believe we only actually effectively use about half of the energy that's currently generated, 98% of it being renewable. Um, and there's a unique opportunity to increase uh, not only the offtake of renewable energy, but also the productive use based on renewable energy um, through storage. So let's have a look at that then. So uh, the battery we just introduced is on the left-hand side. Um, these are figured for convenience. Uh, yes. In the middle, we are presenting our electric uh, wall box installation that is essentially an all-in-one inverter with 2,300 watt hours of storage. 
um, solar direct charging capability and uh, charges also direct of any AC socket. So it's a little power, portable uh, 500 watt power unit, essentially. Um, on the right hand side, basically, you'll see one of the modular solar shades, basically, that uh, we also provide to clients. And uh, it is a 530 watt 2S um, configuration um, for those who are interested. And essentially, any um, two solar panels that uh, can reach uh, an approximate voltage of 60 uh, are able to charge our battery directly without any further, um, yes any further uh, technology is required in between. So what is that, uh, what is new or what's different about what we do? Um, we find that the prevailing technology here that is part of the, the challenge that inhibits not only electric mobility, but generally um, we would probably say power storage as, a, as something that is accepted more widely by the public. Batteries have a bad reputation here and that is based on the fact that most of them are uh, based on lead acid technology. And um, it is a bit of a dated technology. And as this diagram on the left indicates, we only able to cycle about 30 to 40% of the overall capacity of this battery, which means that um, if we were to compare it with the sort of lithium ion batteries basically that we're looking at today, ours are 90%. Um, this depth of discharge that is available to you. It means that one of our 4.6 kilowatt hour batteries is equivalent to four conventional solar batteries. Yes, so put that into perspective. Um, we envision essentially to enable uh, e-mobility and to, to uh, enable more stable power in, or actually access to power where there is none because rural electrification is a separate challenge. We envision um, a sort of a hybrid inverter environment. So you might all be familiar with some of the off-grid and on-grid variants that are available for solar technologies. But what we see is that there is a renewable grid power available in many cases. We see where it isn't, um, solar power is abundant, and we even see that at times uh, things like generators are already in place. So we want to be able to take each of these power sources, basically, and flexibly use them to power our appliances, seen here on the right-hand side, based on what is currently most suitable. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we would, if we're doing a lot of heavy work during the day, we would like to be able to use most of our solar energy so that we have uh, no bill essentially on our energy. But we'd also like to keep our bat batteries topped up enough to make sure that when there's no solar power at night, we don't have to switch on our generator if we have one or if we don't have power or use uh, our Yakai units when uh, we could actually be reusing the excess, bat excess energy that has been stored in the batteries. <clears throat> so. All of this basically is facilitated by um, 21st century monitoring capabilities. And not only is every battery that we build a smart unit, but uh, the inverters too are smart units. And therefore all the information on consumption, on um, the battery state of health and everything else basically is found on the cloud and available on your smartphone or your computer. So. Um, what else is interesting about the, the hybrid approach that we're looking at? Each one of the units that we just saw above uh, is a potential charging station for an electric vehicle. So um, for the experts amongst you, uh, charging from the side of the utility grid, uh, about 80 amps of charging per unit are available and about 100 amps of solar charging are available. That means four to five batteries essentially can be charged if you have one of these inverters installed. So whether you're a shop or a homeowner, you have the potential to help enable an e-mobility ecosystem. So um, what are we looking at in this slide? Uh, we're seeing a configuration of six uh, inverters. It might look a little bit confusing but the only reason that this slide is here is to briefly demonstrate that the systems that we are, that we are installing are perfectly um, parallelable, which means that they can be put together to increase the output. So 
where one unit offers five kilowatt hours, six units can offer 30 kilowatt hours, and they can output either single or three phase electricity depending on the consumer demand and still offering charging capabilities for vehicles all the while. So what have we been busy with here at, at Bodaverk on the application side? Because batteries are well and good, but um, it always helps if there's something to, something to use them with. And that's not only home charging systems or solar systems, but things people can feel and touch more frequently during the day. Um, so one of our major applications, the one that we're probably best known for, is the electric uh, Boda Boda. And it is currently available in two variants. So what we actually did here is focus on an existing platform in the market that uh, has been widely accepted and spare parts network is uh, very well developed across the country and the general region. And uh, we developed two conversion kits. The first basically is an automatic on the left hand side. It is a single speed, two kilowatt uh, conversion, and it is rated for 150 kilograms. And over the course of two years of vehicle development, we ended up with the four speed version that you can find on your right hand side. And this essentially is the vehicle that we can confidently say replaces a Bajaj uh, one to one, the one that basically everybody is so familiar with. Um, it's the one that uh, the Boda Boda has no doubts um, when he rides it. So I'll just give you a little video here so you can get an idea of how silent the whole electric affair is. That's if the sound is available to everybody. And let me make sure a second. Oh, excuse me. And to have had a reload. Let's jump back. All right. So moving on from the two-wheeler, uh, we have also looked into three-wheelers because uh, we see that it's another one of the predominant vehicles in the market. Um, we have adapted existing uh, vehicles that were brought in by other suppliers, and uh, we have once again adapted one of the locally abundant platforms and in an effort basically to, to help with the visibility and to, to ease the question of whether vehicles can charge themselves we uh, created one with a solar roof and the necessary charging infrastructure to be able to operate this vehicle non-stop on certain payloads so some of the clients that we currently have essentially are operating these vehicles without ever having to charge them so uh, one further question that was answered, um, yeah, a couple of examples of where uh, you might be able to find some of the vehicles um, that we have built so far. So uh, this is one of the examples where a farm near Kampala City basically is enabled with um, our electric mobility products. So it's very much already a reality. Um, this is <clears throat> the electric tractor conversion that we've developed. So again, there is a locally available um, two-wheel tractor platform uh, where we remove the conventional Changfa uh, diesel engine as it's known and replace it with an electric powertrain and uh, has been running field tests um, for uh, yeah, combination probably around a year now. And, uh, Launching and um, operating our pilot project in the north of Uganda and Apache. And I'll just start this video to give an idea of the operation. I hope you can hear the sound because there's relatively little as compared to um, the big diesel tractor. All right. Um, yes, so. 
this tractor is operated out of uh, a hub that is in a patch, northern Uganda. And we shall now talk about what exactly it's doing there. So on the left-hand side, um, because plowing is not an all-year-round activity, uh, we can see uh, the tractor connected on the pulley basically to a stationary mill. So instead of, um, let me say, doing field operation right now, it's grinding maize. And uh, these are some of the ancillary services that you can now see on the right-hand side uh, that we intend to offer, all based on our flexible energy storage in an effort basically to, <clears throat> to be able to share um, the demand for energy and therefore also share the, the overall cost basically of energy storage uh, across multiple applications and make sure that uh, vehicles like this tractor basically can stay operational year round. Um, so this is some of the charging infrastructure that is currently set up in uh, Northern Uganda. So we basically had one modular solar container that we moved with. So this is currently the first expansion um, variant for the small project at three kilowatts peak. And on the right is 530 watt peak solar shade. And uh, yeah, if you have very good eyes, you'll be able to see two walking tractors inside that um, round shed. Um, yes. So once again, e-mobility um, is very much uh, thing already so one of the, the really the points that were very close to our heart was um, looking at the lake too because uh, we feel that um, the outboard probably is one of the, the most outdated um, internal combustion engines that's still on the market so the potential basically to, to do good there is relatively relatively large um, so we do also offer um, electric outboards uh, they again operate off the same um, 4.6 kilowatt hour battery that we saw before. And uh, in this scenario, you can see the gentleman basically slotting two of those units under the driver's seat uh, before going out on the tour. So let's maximize this video again here if I can. Apparently, I cannot. Then I will leave it uh, small as it is. All right. So moving on. In an effort basically to be able to sustain the efforts that we have on the ground and to build the operations that we have already, um, HR basically is the key challenge um, or opportunity because job creation essentially is what is required so much here and having um, sustainable jobs in the future proof market seems like a very positive thing to be working on. So we spent a lot of time um, on developing our own training syllabuses and uh, we have spent a lot of time on having um, employee onboarding routines so that we have the opportunity basically to, to teach as many people as we can and uh, to share the, the little knowledge that we have amongst others to be able to uh, sustain what we're trying to do because we believe that uh, more and more of um, the technology basically that is actually known, understood, owned, uh, developed, built on ground basically, the, the better opportunity we have to, to profit from e-mobility as a whole here in the region. So um, as we're coming to a close, I'll present some of uh, the other projects that we've worked on in the past um, or currently still working on. So, left so you can see the electric wheelchairs that we've been developing in conjunction with Mulago Orthopedics Workshop. Um, you can see some of the electronics component repairs that we've been doing uh, for other clients and you can see some of the more custom vehicle conversion projects that uh, we have been doing as well on the right hand side. So what is ultimately what is the market that uh, we speak of? Um, we see that in Africa, basically, um, we still have 600 million people that uh, lack access to electricity. And we have 
excess generation of renewable uh, energy um, and likely to be in the region of 673 terawatts of renewable energy by 2040. Um, in the transport sector, uh, we have a, an annual fuel bill in sub-Saharan Africa of about 2 billion US dollars. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, we have more than 3 million uh, vehicles in the region and uh, growing rapidly. In the agricultural sector, um, the estimated GDP by 2030 is going to be about a trillion US dollars. And 80% uh, of that is projected to be produced by smallholder farmers. So if they can be enabled with electric solutions as well, all the better. Finally, um, I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for your attention during this presentation. And I'd like to present to you um, our team, the WorldVec team. Um, we're currently a staff of uh, 42 uh, full-time employees, um, uh, four co-founders, and basically it's been it's been a journey i mentioned initially that i was an electric startup company in germany and we grew from 30 to over 100 so uh in our time basically here on my time we've grown from about 10 employees to the 42 we are today so it's it's been another very interesting journey very rewarding one as well so far so thank you for your time There we go. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Janusz, for that interesting presentation. And it's been great to see such a range of products as well that you've touched on and kind of look forward to hearing more in the session as we go forward with questions. But um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I think I will hand over to Alan uh, Muhumuza next, and then we will have quite a bit of time for the question and answer session hopefully. Um, Alan, who, will, who is about to speak, is from Kira Mutas. He is the Director of Marketing and Sales there. Um, it is also a company that is familiar with uh, e-mobility and has done work around that. And I think we will hear more from Alan. I'll let him give us a, tell, share more about what he's going to speak of, <laughs> share more in his topic. Um, but yeah, Alan, please feel free to go ahead, share your screen. Thank you, Randy. Okay. I hope we can all see the screen. Uh, yeah, my name is Alan Mohumza, and it's a pleasure to, to be a part of this uh, discussion and dialogue. Uh, it's, it's the perfect time for us to be talking about electric mobility, especially as we see the advent um, effects of uh, on, on climate change, um, uh, as well as uh, the need for transportation and also other other areas of usage, uh, like Yenosh uh, uh, has pointed out, uh, that require uh, you know rethinking uh, in terms of, of how we've been doing things. From uh, a question, which I uh, I work for as the director of marketing and sales, um, has a vision to. To, to build a better Uganda through automotive technology with the mission of being the best in class motor vehicle manufacturer in Africa. And with our five core values, uh, with the customer at the heart to ensure that we build solutions that meet uh, problems and address the needs of uh, the average Ugandan through innovation and collaboration because we believe that it's not just about competition. The automotive industry actually has thrived on collaboration. If you see right from the start, uh, we exemplify professionalism in all that we do. And we ensure that we continue to empower and build community. And I believe this is one of those sessions where we continue to build community around electric mobility and what it represents for us as a country. Akira Motors Corporation is a state enterprise which was established to champion value addition in the nascent motor vehicle industry in Uganda. And we're doing it through three areas, uh, technology transfer, uh, contract manufacturing, as well as supply chain localization. And uh, here the key is to ensure that we can build as much local content as possible within uh, the value chain and create value uh, within the economy. 
Our shareholders are Government of Uganda, that is represented by the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, and Macquarie University, uh, where this whole story began. Um, and it's important to note that um, building of the indigenous port of eco industry is really consistent with what Uganda is aspiring for towards uh, a middle income economy as per the Fusion 2040, as well as the National Development Plan 3 and the manifesto of the current government in three key areas as the promotion of local manufacturing of motor vehicles. And it's exciting to also see the likes of Bodawek uh, doing some exciting stuff. Uh, for more collaboration and you know diversifying what we as a nation can offer to the world. Establishment of an efficient, integrated, safe, sustainable and inclusive public transport system, uh, which I'll talk about a bit more in detail and as well as promotion of environmentally friendly transport solutions. I, I would like to quickly just go over, over what the current situation is like when you look at the automotive industry, as well as uh, public transport. To answer the question of why should this be really a, a focus, a topic for us to focus on at such a time. Uh, globally, uh, the automotive industry has an annual turnover of over 3 trillion US dollars. That represents about 3.6% of global GDP and over 86 million units were sold in just 2017 alone. Looking at Africa, 1.2 million vehicles were sold in just 2017 and is projected to be to reach 10 million by 2030. Within our, our borders of East Africa, uh, East African community, uh, sales increased from 158,000 to 57,000 and are projected to reach 600,000, over 600,000 by 2030. Uh, actually today, so a number plate of a, a UB, uh, UBK, if I'm not mistaken. And so someone took a picture of the UBK number plate and. Uh, it's, it's evident that people are buying cars, not just cars, but vehicles really in particular. Road transport accounts for over 95% of passenger traffic and 96.5% of freight cargo in Uganda. And we import uh, vehicles worth 450 million US dollars a year. It's the second highest import commodity after oil and uh, petroleum products, which go into the cars in any case. So it's important that we look at how we do you know, balance of trade and, uh, and keep uh, these, these dollars within, within our economy. Uh, and looking at the public transport sector specifically, uh, in terms of uh, motorized transportation, 41% uh, is in public transport. So we're looking at taxis, buses, 10.1% in border borders, while 7.9% in private cars. But looking at Kampala specifically, uh, it's estimated that we lose over 24,000 man hours in traffic congestion. Uh, it's about 800 million US dollars annually. Um, due to the fact that you know, the transport system we are utilizing is, is not sustainable. Uh, with low capacity motors, uh, minibuses that we are utilizing to transport people. Uh, as well as uh, the private cars that carry one or two maximum streets. We are burning extra 500 million shillings a day from traffic congestion. That's just wasted fuel, which could be utilized to go into other areas like, uh, you know, uh, our, our livelihood. And Kampala is ranked the second most polluted city uh, in, in Africa and top 15 in the world. Uh, actually, during the first lockdown, uh, studies showed that air quality in Kampala had, had improved by over 90%. And it, it, it's not surprising that urban mobility, according to studies, contributes to 40% of all CO2 emissions from road transport. And uh, different studies, of course, have different figures when it comes to what is the contributor for greenhouse gases uh, as sectors. Electricity and heat is the biggest at about 30%. But the country we are in, Uganda, where a majority of 80% of our electricity is renewable, uh, this is not a conversation we can have. But transportation is the second highest at 15% contribution to greenhouse gases. And it's important that we, we start seeing how do we uh, create solutions 
that are domestic, that address our domestic requirements. Um, and of course, it's, it's also unfortunate that 85% of the vehicles we purchase are used, 50% uh, are new at an average age of 16 years at first time registration. This is really end of life technology, uh, for lack of a better word. So that's why the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation uh, set, up, set in place um, a, a multi-sectoral task force uh, with Kira Motors Corporation as secretariat to put in place the national, uh, national automotive industry policy, which really is looking at how do we produce over 500,000 vehicles annually by 2030, but enhancing supply chain localization, promoting clean mobility, promoting you know, automotive applications and adoption of increased labor productivity in all sectors, promoting compliance to standards, uh, requisite infrastructure that would be required, such as charging infrastructure, uh, like how Borderwick is currently looking at how they can establish, you know, uh, solar powered charging infrastructure for their for their different applications. But how do we also standardize this whole sector uh, to, to develop to ensure that we are competitive as a country within the global space? So Kiramoto's Corporation is is really playing a part in the three tiers of develop make and sell of vehicles, or we research and development, design, engineering, and testing. Then we source automotive parts and components and help uh, small and medium enterprises to establish themselves in uh, being parts manufacturers, go through whole vehicle assembly, and then through to marketing, distribution, and after sales service. Government of Uganda allocated 100 acres of land in the Ginger Industry and Business Park uh, along the Kamuri, Ginger Kamuri Highway, where construction is underway. And uh, the Kira vehicle plant is currently at about 80% completion and is being constructed by National Enterprise Corporation, the business arm of the Ministry of, of Defense and Veteran Affairs. And this facility with over 40,000 square meters of production space will be able to, uh, to support um, an assembly shop, a paint shop, a chassis fabrication area, an assembly line, an electrophoresis or electroplating shop, so that we're able to not only serve the demand for Uganda, but also for the rest of the world at an installed capacity of 5,000 buses or vehicles per year, which translates to about 22 per day. And uh, this should be operational by the end of this year uh, to, to really enable us to, to build vehicles, not just for us, but also for other uh, partners, because we're looking at contract manufacturing as one of those things that we'd like to do, and this is where it currently stands uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of how far we are going. But more importantly is what are we going to be making uh, in, in, this, in this plant and, and, and where are we now? Well, Kira Motors Corporation uh, through technology transfer has developed the Kayola EVS, a low flow uh, city bus, which has a, a range of 300 kilometers on a single charge, purely electric. Um, it dubs a 560 ampere hour battery pack, uh, that's its energy capacity, and uh, the motor power is about 245 kilowatts. It consumes uh, one unit of electricity per kilometer, uh, which makes it really competitive, especially for bus operators, because uh, at, at, uh, at uh, off-peak uh, rates, you're looking at about 320 shillings per kilometer for it to, to be utilized compared to over 1,700 of a diesel equivalent shillings per kilometer. It has a capacity of 90 passengers. So the design we're looking at is how do we have a device that will be able to address issues of congestion with large capacity, to address issues of, uh, of climate change through a zero type emission, zero tail pipe emission bus, but also through safety, because we're looking at five key system quality attributes for this bus. Accessibility, sustainability, safety, economic efficiency, as well as environmental stewardship. Uh, there is Wi-Fi on board for this bus as well, all tra travelers, as well as USB charging. Um, and I'm sure you also saw in one of the clips, an automatic sanitizer dispenser. Uh, there's inclusive design when we're building this bus. So there is a ramp for people with disability to be able to board and off board easily. 
It's a 12.5 meter bus. Uh, so it's able to, to carry the 90 passengers comfortably seated and standing. Uh, so it, it's able to eliminate over eight small uh, matter tools on the road, one single bus. We've also built the Kyola diesel coach because the bus with its limitation uh, of charging infrastructure, uh, there was need to also look at how do we, in the meantime, uh, as, an, as an intervention, have a bus that can go a long distance if you, to, if you want to go to Nairobi, for example. So we designed and built the Kyola diesel coach, uh, which is a, a, a long distance uh, executive bus, which uh, has 47 seats, the luxury trim, and each seat is fitted with a magazine holder, a footrest, a table, a foldable table, cup holders. But more importantly, to ensure safety, uh, we have uh, uh, an onboard toilet, because most times when you're traveling long distances, you, 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 you might be faced with uh, risks going into uh, unsafe places for nature's call, but also a fridge uh, on board as well for refreshments. Uh, but our, our desire and our target is to also see how we have a long distance electric bus as we continue to, to put in place uh, the requisite infrastructure that will support electric mobility across the country. And, 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 and as we go along, I'll be sharing with you some of the interventions that we have put in place uh, so far, we have three buses, two Kyola EVS electric buses and one diesel coach, and they have been offering shuttle services for Uganda Civil Aviation Authority since July of last year. So they've been in operation for close to 11 months now, uh, weekly uh, transporting staff between Kampala and Entebbe Airport and back. Uh, this was a, more of a market validation exercise and it has demonstrated that these buses uh, are able to handle the, the duty cycle um, sustainably. Uh, for those of you the Northern Bypass, the, the expressway, you'll observe it has so many hills and valleys, hills and valleys. So we have tested and, and validated uh, the EVS electric bus in such terrains, and it's still able to sufficiently deliver as expected. You also note that we, it's designed for over 3,000 charge cycles before you need to replace the batteries. So that means able to go 900,000 kilometers before you need to do an overhaul of the battery pack. Uh, there is no diesel equivalent that can give you 900,000 kilometers before you need to replace the engine uh, anywhere in the world. So these are, the, these are the advantages we are seeing with electric mobility. And, it, and because it's electric, it creates also other, uh, other opportunities especially when it comes to validated services that you can fit into the bus. So things like onboard diagnostics, then, uh, we are building a comprehensive passenger experience system, which will be able to, in real time, see uh, the state of batteries, the state of, uh, of charge, the health of the batteries themselves, the speed at which the bus is going, uh, do fleet management, uh, such that it's, it's an extra value for fleet owners to be able to, at the top of a button, uh, be able to see the performance of their buses and also monitor over time uh, to ensure that you have efficiency for your fleet. Local content, sub, local content development is key. We've developed a, a, a strategy uh, where we, we are targeting uh, 68, 60, over 60% local content by 2030. And we have laid out a roadmap. We have already identified uh, a number of, of local companies uh, because the automotive industry thrives on a, on a supply chain. The vehicle manufacturer at the center uh, utilizes uh, so many small and medium enterprises, people that make brake pads, people that make uh, the leather seats, people that make the, flu the floor, like our floor is made of bamboo, uh, so the opportunities, people that, that make the door, people that make uh, the, the, the fascia boards, the front and the back, the chassis, the frame, and all these are opportunities. And we have a wealth of natural resources I would want to tap into uh, and ensure that we are able to, to build the, the, the industry uh, holistically along the entire supply chain to create more value and create more jobs sustainably. Uh, and to achieve this, we have gone ahead uh, to acquire 1,280 acres of land in Kayunga, uh, Bale, Bale Kayunga, 
where we intend to put in place the automotive industry and technology park. This park will have another production facility for pickups and SUVs, uh, which will be at an installed capacity of 100,000 vehicles per year. Um, and uh, we also uh, have over 50 acres, uh, over 500 acres that will be allocated for automotive parts suppliers to set up production facilities. So there will be incentives that we can give to, to parts suppliers and manufacturers to set up shop near our production facilities and kickstart the investment uh, to already position themselves. We'll also have comprehensive proving grounds. If you'll observe at the back, those squiggly lines, uh, that's, that would be a proving ground for vehicles of safety, uh, especially for, for the vehicles that you're putting on the road, be carrying quite a number of people. We'll also have an automotive technology and innovation center to ensure that we continue developing technology uh, here. Right now, we, have, we are on a base, we're building a foundation of technology transfer from China, but we will we'll build upon that to now see how do we domesticate and, and, and create uh, more technology, because there's a lot when, when you look at connected, autonomous, shared and electric mobility, there's a lot of opportunity uh, and a lot of untapped potential. Uh, that we can also, as a country, position ourselves to be leaders on, just like Taiwan positioned itself to be a leader when it comes to integrated circuits. Uh, we'll have a business center as well and an automotive industry scaling center. Uh, I think this is something that, have, that, that will be critical to develop a critical mass that will be utilized in the making of, of these vehicles. Along with the charging infrastructure, uh, currently we are utilizing uh, the GBT uh, protocol. There are so many protocols. Uh, Japanese is what we call CHAdeMO, uh, the North America CCS1, the EU CCS2, and China GBT. Uh, Tesla also has its own. So I think how do we have a standard? Just like you'll have an iPhone, cannot charge the same way as a Samsung. Can't inter 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 you can't have the two charging uh, with the same cable. How do we have uh, standards in place to ensure that uh, whatever vehicle is coming into the market is able to utilize the same charging infrastructure. And that would be key. And uh, the Minister of Energy is also within the country um, and, uh, and have it more sustainable, have it more accessible uh, wherever you are. Uh, we have also gone ahead to, you know, to beyond just making these buses, how do we put them into use? How do we have them on the road? And we are working with Tondeka Metro, uh, Rentco, as well as Golden Dragon to produce 30,000 buses for the regional market with 65% parts and components localized by 2030. And uh, more importantly, by, by uh, uh, in the course of this year, we have already embarked on a project to start the deployment of over 1,000 buses, a fifth of which will be electric within the city. And this initiative is aimed at modernizing public transport in the urban centers in Uganda and beyond, while building the indigenous motor vehicle industry within the country. I believe this is one of the projects that will enable us to address the issues that are surrounding public transportation within the country, especially within, within Kampala, where we're seeing an average travel time of five kilometers per hour, uh, taking over two hours to move from your home to your to your job to your to your workplace. Uh, lastly, there, 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 there is value that working together to deliver on electric mobility within this country uh, will can create for us as a nation. Uh, just this this investment is expected to create over thirty six thousand jobs directly and indirectly within five years from the start of series production, but also increasing the demand of utilization of our natural resources that we have, uh, that, that unfortunately are being, ex some of them are being exported in raw form to China, and then we are importing finished products. How do we, how do we change this narrative? Uh, of course, this will also lead to localization of investment by small and medium enterprises uh, in the areas of manufacturing of vehicle parts, components, and autonomous systems. And lastly, clean energy vehicle technology will help us to curb the annual loss in GDP due to climate change, 
as well as have a cleaner environment where we can uh, leave a heritage for the future generation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, for that presentation. Um, it was very extensive and just interesting to hear uh, what you have been working on and everything around this solar bus concept. Um, I think we will go we will go into a question and answer session um, as quickly as possible. There, I'm sure there are loads of questions that people would like to ask. And so just to the attendees, I will. Um, you could raise your hand and I will let you speak if you'd like to talk. Otherwise, you can use the question and answer box. Um, but to start, I will hand over to um, Alan Samakula, who will, I guess, initiate the question and answer process. Um, so thank you again to Alan and Janosch for your presentations. And I look forward to seeing what happens with this conversation. All right. Um, thank you, Randy. Um, thank you, Rianos and uh, Alan for the presentation. It was quite insightful. Um, I have a question for Janos. I think you glossed over the issue of the battery. Um, I don't know if you can hear me clearly. Randy, can you hear me? Very yes, well, I can, yeah. can hear you. Yeah. Um, we know that uh, in most of these systems, the battery is the is the problem. Um, we want to know what are you doing differently, and what percentage of what you're doing is uh, local content. Um, because besides the the duration of the batteries that are on the market, they, there is also the concern of how we um, uh, sustainably dispose of them. Um, thank you. Okay, um, that's a very thorough question. So initially about 50% uh, of our battery is produced from pure local content. So I have to start out right away with the individual lithium ion cells. Um, those lithium ion cells basically are only produced on a few facilities worldwide and um, we source ours from Korea, from LG. Um, Basically, what then happens is that they're put into some kind of, uh, let me say, structure, which is able to hold these batteries. Um, and ultimately, these uh, then are wrapped and encased and spot welded together here. Um, we manufacture mild steel casings. We do painting, coating, ETC. We um, basically mount ancillary components like the battery management system I mentioned. So that is also locally developed, currently produced uh, externally, but um, very much in the progress of being produced locally as well with our local partner, which is a very nice thing to see. Um, so you asked an important question, um, you know, what really, what makes that battery better? What, what, what differentiates it? And I managed to touch on the, the sort of the energy that you can take out of a lithium ion battery versus the energy that you can take out of a lead acid battery. Um, the key thing though is if you basically, if you buy quality cells, if you have a, an intelligent battery management system, um, the cycle life of these batteries typically goes to around 3,500 cycles. So if uh, you're to cycle your battery empty and full every day and recharge it again, then it will last you for approximately nine to 10 years. So to get an idea basically of, of what's different, you know, it's not like a lead acid battery that has a couple of hundred cycle rating if uh, used incorrectly. If used correctly, it might do a thousand cycles. Right? But um, the challenge is basically they often cycle beyond the 30% that I explained earlier and therefore don't even last that long. So that problem doesn't exist with this more modern technology on the one hand. Um, and the other thing is basically through being able to um, piece this battery together literally from the raw materials that you know, are available for it anyway here locally, right? Uh, to a complete battery pack that communicates with your smartphone. Um, is for us the key and the proof, you know, that we can put them out in the market and still offer the after sales services that are required um, to keep them operational. But to be very honest, um, 
sort of uh, batteries and motors are really not the weak points of EVs. Uh, they actually tend to hold up very well because uh, you know there's no really there's no physical wear and tear there. It's uh, all chemical and electrical. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. I, I could ex I could also add my voice. Um, uh, uh, indeed, lithium-ion batteries present more opportunities and and advantages because uh, yeah, the, with with the, with the, with the longer charge cycles uh, like the our our bus, which is capable of three thousand minimum charge cycles, uh, and with the duty cycle that we are looking at within urban mobility, it will take you about eight years before you can get to the point where you need to check the, the battery cells and see which ones are healthy and ones might not be. But the conversation of, uh, of, uh, of, of recycling and e-waste, I think now there's really more of a question of how do we deal with e-waste? Uh, I know there are a number of companies globally that are exploring uh, how do we uh, recycle uh, lithium-ion batteries? Because even at the end of their life, there are some materials that can be utilized to get back into the, 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 the value chain of, of, of battery production. And because electric mobility globally is still in its infancy, we have not yet reached at the stage where we have a considerable amount of, uh, of waste batteries. We, we are still getting close to it. And, and I think there's still a lot of research and development that's ongoing. Uh, even as, as Kira Motors, it's, it's, a, it's a conversation we are having and exploring how do we prepare ourselves for when we start reaching the end of life of our batteries. How do we ready ourselves for the six to eight years from now? I'm already working with uh, a, a number of, of researchers, uh, crafting different projects to see how can we start uh, attracting not just funding, but also opportunities because this, this will require the whole global value chain really to, to, to play out because if, if you need access to, to use these batteries, you need to get into some markets where there's been a, a bigger uptake of, 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 of vehicles. So I think that's a conversation that will continue to happen even as, as battery technology continues to improve because uh, also seeing a lot of research when it comes to solid state batteries, which might have a larger charge, uh, charge density beyond what the lithium ion can be able to give you, reducing on the size of the, on the weight of the battery and giving you more, more range. So I think there's still a lot of conversation in terms of the technology around batteries and their, uh, and their disposal properly. Okay. I think if I can go ahead and open the floor to other questions. I will just allow um, Rob El Giddy to ask his question. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Do Do I need to turn on my video or not? Um. I think it's okay. I, I'm not sure if you can. <laughs> um, oh, okay. I can. Okay, so it's okay. So yeah. my name is Rob Dal. I'm from Ethiopia, just the neighbor, the neighbor, the neighbor of Uganda here. Uh, it's a really great presentation and it's a really great solutions. Uh, I really like uh, what you guys are talking about. What solution are you guys doing? You know, uh, you know, it's very very uh, impressive. Uh, just to put it that. Uh, so uh, I posted on my question and A, uh, the, the first question I have, I think uh, is for the first presenter for the, uh, I, I forgot his name, but sorry. The, the first person who spoke, uh, the question I have is, do you guys own the charging stations or you use other people's established space for the charging space, just like gas stations? Do you guys build the infrastructure of the charging stations or you just go into shops or any other like low investment cost uh, to lower your cost? And the second question I have is for the second person who was talking at, I think it's uh, for the electric, uh, uh, for the electric bus. Uh, how much local, like 
uh, how much uh, local adding value do you guys do uh, in Uganda when you guys do the electric bus manufacture or assembly and uh, when you import it from abroad? Because uh, it's impossible to import, uh, it's impossible to do everything here in Africa, I understand. So how many percent do you guys uh, add value to the electric bus? Uh, and is it just a prototype are you guys talking about or you guys started uh, producing? Uh, so that's the two questions I have. Uh, yeah, and also for the third question I have is for the lithium ion batteries. Uh, the recycling, it's a re very good idea because in the world, the world is moving to the electric and uh, one of the demanded thing will be the recycling because there's a, a limited type of resource for the lithium ion. In Africa, the Zimbabwe has a biggest resource for you know making the lithium ion batteries. And also in South America, Chile, the three triangles and Australia. So uh, uh, yeah, it's a really good idea for the recycling. And um, is there any recycling uh, company in Africa doing that so far? Or, or are you guys uh, just about to be the first one doing that? Thank you. All right, um, shall I start? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah go, go ahead, ahead. sorry. Um, sure, uh, so initially, um, we uh, do not need to own every inverter slash charging station that we install now. The idea is very much to democratize basically and enable people to do business with energy and therefore expand our charging network. Um, we do, of course, also develop specific um, charging hubs ourselves, but that is, you know, if there's a strategic um, reason behind that infrastructure development, so it is part of the strategy. Um, now, uh, to just touch on the whole recycling deal, uh, there's multiple lifetimes, just first of all, which um, can be attained with this more modern battery technology. So when battery, lithium-ion battery packs, physically, if they're well managed through electronics, when they are, let me say, at a level where they're no longer usable in your, um, in your vehicle, because for example, your range has now halved where you used to be able to go 100 kilometers, you now can only go 50 and that's not good enough for you. That's still um, basically a very, very powerful battery for, for example, home backup scenarios or for somebody who wanted to give uh, mobile generator services or anything else, basically, any other storage scenario, it's still a very powerful battery. And there's still, I'd say, two thirds of the battery's lifetime left to go. Um, then finally, um, on the chemical recycling that you mentioned as well, um, and, uh, that Alan talked of. So in today's money, basically, you can um, get recycling facilities that are up to about 85% efficient in terms of their uh, reproduction of the raw material. So um, there's definitely some, some promise there, yes. Uh, sorry, we got disconnected. Can you repeat it please for the lithium ion battery recycling? Uh, I didn't hear that. Sure, um, what I was saying is that, is that there are processes today that are 85% efficient on um, material uh, regeneration, basically on extraction from the recycling process. So there is definitely promise there too, even if the battery is not necessarily the only or the final answer for immobility. I think on, on my side, um, I think there are two key questions. One was on local content, the other one was on if it's a prototype, if we're at prototype stage of production. Um, uh, in terms of local content, did like you've pointed out, uh, the automotive industry thrives on a, on a supply chain, and this supply chain is typically global. It's difficult to have the entire supply chain domestic uh, because there are different capabilities that could be found in different regions. Um, but the, the target is how do we uh, localize as much of the, of the supply chain as possible. Uh, our, our, our strategy was to utilize local technology transfer such that we are able to tap into an existing global supply chain and suppliers easily. And then we utilize that to grow the domestic, uh, the domestic, domestic supply chain. Uh, because typically if you're to create a part, for example, something as it might look simple like a seat, you need to go through a comprehensive advanced product quality planning process and a production part approval process. 
and that takes time because uh, the manufacturer needs to put in place proper manufacturing systems that you need to validate to ensure quality. Because if it's uh, if, it, if there's any if it's like a chassis and there's any structural defect that will have catastrophic effects or impact on your on your bus. So it takes time to build a, a typical supplier from the app. So that's why we're saying how do we start from an existing platform and then localize from there and build capacity. And that's why we are targeting 38% local content by 2026 and 65% by value of the bus by 2030. Uh, the buses we have on the road are not prototypes. They are production vehicles. So we already built these buses uh, utilizing a, a production space in, this, in the central region, a place called Nakasongola at Luere Industries Limited. As our plant in Jinja gets ready, we utilize the, a temporary facility uh, to build these buses from ground up and they are operational, fully operational on the road. Yes, uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I just want to add one last comment and then I'll be finished. So uh, for the speakers and audience, uh, I'm in Ethiopia and I'm uh, very, very interested in the electric mobility and I have a project uh, right now. So I would like to talk with you guys after our webinar. Please, I sent you a LinkedIn uh, uh, connection, Robel, and you can, uh, Robbie, you can find me there and uh, we can talk more about it. Uh, we already have the, you know, the factory uh, that will be assembled uh, for future electric mobility ready in Ethiopia, in the capital at this. And uh, we just want to do a collaborate with other countries, uh, especially Uganda. So let's keep in touch, please. Thank you. We'll do, Ravel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ravel. Um, I'll move on to another hand up. So Felix, please go ahead and speak. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for your, for your interesting presentations. I've also put uh, my questions in the, in the Q&A box, but um, I may as well ask one of them to each of you. Um, Starting with Janos, um, obviously you, you, your company is called Bodawerk and, and, and we are all sort of, I guess many people are fascinated by the idea of electrifying borders, um, especially if you live in Kampala and, and if your numbers are right that we have 150,000 of them, which, which doesn't surprise me too much. Um, there's a huge scope there to, you know, make the city more livable and, 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 and greener if, if that was really a way to go forward. Can you just give us sort of some practical ideas a bit more around that whole border idea? So for instance, um, what's a typical, you know, what, what, is, what does a typical border uh, rider actually travel per day? What's a typical travel distance? How does it relate to a typical battery load? And um, so in other words, can, you know, one day of riding, of average riding, could that be actually by one battery? And then also what what would be the cost of, of one of these? And, and, and let's say, how far away are you from, from sort of bringing this out into the market so that you really can see maybe a substantial, numbers of, a substantial number of people actually use, starting to use it? Maybe I, I, I leave it there. And then uh, when you're done answering, I, I could ask my second question to, to Alan. Thanks. OK, cool. Um, I think I'll start with the second question. Um, so uh, we've already deployed um, close to 60 motorcycles. Um, we've deployed a further 12 uh, three-wheelers, so that's electric tuk-tuks, two outboards, and three electric tractors at this point. So the solutions are very much already on sale. Um, uh, the only thing that's on pre-order is a new hybrid inverter solution, essentially, that I mentioned. Um, in terms of uh, having such a vehicle available, um, you can either um, come in for a conversion of your existing vehicle. If you uh, would report, like the automatic version, it will cost you 2.5 million shillings. Um, if you'd like the geared version, that will cost you 3 million shillings. Uh, if you'd like a ready-made vehicle from parts, um, then we can sell you the, the automatic at 5.5 million and the uh, geared version at 6 million. Um, in terms of the uh, sort of average riding profile of a rider, it's important to mention again that there's no magic. So electricity works very much like fuel. So if you load heavily, um, basically, you know, you're going to have higher consumption. You will not go as far, etc. So 
on average, um, one of those 4.6 kilowatt hour batteries in uh, one of these e-boarders can go about 100 kilometers. So if a rider uh, don't know, loads several bags worth of cement on the vehicle, he's not going to achieve those 100 kilometers. But yes, and as the average distance traveled by border riders can be approximated to around 100 kilometers, it is basically uh, just suitable for a daily ride. What we envision, though, is that um, the system will be a little more intricate than that, and people will charge during the day when they're stationary, and they will swap where necessary. And our system is that democratic, we will allow for that. Um, but typically today, basically, a border rider um, is not in possession of his motorcycle. So the first 10,000 shillings that he, um, he earns go towards covering his rental. Um, the next um, sort of 12 to 18K, depending on, on, on his movement, or 12 to 15,000, depending on his movement, will go to, um, will go to fuel. Um, there is, a, let me say, a percentage of maintenance that will break down into that day as well, but we'll leave that, we'll leave that out. So he's already spending, let me say, roughly uh, 22 to 25,000 shillings on average to cover um, those 100 kilometers and do business. So yeah, uh, that's the current scenario. And if, of course, basically you can reduce that fuel bill from, from three liters on average for those 100 kilometers, which currently equates to about 13,000 shillings, um, then you can replace it even, let me say, in the worst energy tariff, uh, Yaka units of 750 um, uh, shillings per kilowatt hour, um, you would be using roughly 3,000 shillings to replenish that battery that goes the same 100 kilometers. So that is very much um, how I can uh, sort of parallel those two systems. Uh, does that answer your question, Felix? Yeah, it does. It does. Thank, thanks a lot. Um, of course, it, I guess it will always be the question how you how you solve the problem of the initial capital investment, which is very high. Um, Absolutely, and we're a small company. We're not very. We're not a bank, so we can't give everybody a solution on a loan. But we're working on on such partnerships as well. So um, that certainly won't stop the solution from reaching those who don't have the upfront capital. Um, cool. Um, then my, my other question to, to Alan um, is in regards to, to, to Kayola and to, to public transport, um, especially when it comes to Kampala. I saw you, you, you there was a small um, um, map that you showed that sort of showed some routes and it shows that you guys are, um, are doing what other people did before, which is thinking about uh, a bus rapid transit system. At least I hope that is the case. And my question is really whether you have any plans for higher capacity buses uh, that are needed for a BRT system, so triple articulated buses that, that run on dedicated lanes. Um, is that something that um, in the future battery technology could also do, or is there a certain limit at some point when it comes to to weight and, 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 and distance and, and, and such things? Uh, thank you, Felix. Um, indeed, uh, the conversation of public transport, especially with buses, the BRT is one of those uh, unavoidable uh, discussions. And uh, Kampala Capacity Authority in its uh, multimodal urban master plan for Kampala actually highlights the bus rapid transit system as one of its uh, priority projects. And it already started uh, putting in place some requisite infrastructure uh, in a few areas, expanding some roads, putting bus lanes, much as unfortunately those bus lanes are currently not operational as bus lanes, but they can easily be converted to be bus lanes. Uh, our current legal or regulatory framework still has limitations on how long a bus can be. So you can't longer than 12 meters on the road in our city. So the articulated buses, as much as they are possible, currently the regulatory framework does not support them. And it's something that we can definitely build because it's not very complicated to build an articulated bus. Um, and uh, with electric mobility, you just increase on the number of batteries. But of course, there's that weight uh, equation which you need to, to factor in to ensure that you're still efficient in your energy consumption per head or per person on the bus. But uh, indeed, articulated electric buses have possibilities and they already exist because uh, companies like TAM already have articulated electric buses. So the technology is there. 
it's just a regulatory framework that should also catch up to facilitate. And these are conversations also having with the Ministry of Works and Transport to see how, because uh, it's not only that, it's also if you look at the logbook, the typical registration book for a bus, still has things to do with engine capacity. Uh, you know, it, it's not alive to the new technologies. So those are some of the of, of the challenges that can easily be resolved with, with new policy reforms to address that. Um, and indeed, our, our solution we are, we are prospecting should, should really facilitate a bus rapid transit transition within the central business district. There are already areas where there's, there's parking, for example, city parking, and it's a conversation having with KCC, how those can be converted into bus lanes without the need to build new infrastructure. Of course, that might have an impact on uh, revenue, but with the elimination of street parking, it also be a disincentive for someone to come with their car within the city and opt for the public transport system. So the, there's a whole conversation happening there with the, with the city authority, with the, with the policy makers, as well as other stakeholders. Hope that sheds some light. It does. I guess if you say that uh, um, regulatory framework is the, is the main problem, then that shouldn't be a big problem, I think. I mean, you're a government institution, so sh you should have ways of engaging the various bodies to change those things. I guess um, the investment in the system overall must be the bigger, uh, the cost of the system must be the bigger challenge, no? Of, of course, the government being a system, there are protocols that, 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 that need, to, need to be followed. And those can be with red tape and all that, they can be quite uh, an uphill task, but it's a, it's, a, it's a gradual process to see how we bring all these stakeholders to appreciate uh, with the Ministry of Works that is responsible for, 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 for the area of, of transportation, with the Ministry of Local Government that is responsible for aspects of, 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 uh, of uh, the, the Greater Kampala metropolitan area, for example, the city authorities, the local councils. So it's a multifaceted problem that needs a, a more holistic approach and it might take a bit of time, but uh, the beauty of indeed us being a government institution has made it possible for us to have much faster uh, inroads because they are, they are a place we're able to reach much easily and have conversations much better in those areas. Uh, and with the government subsidies, especially when it comes to electric, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the grid and ensuring that the grid can be accessible everywhere, uh, aspects of uh, incentives that could uh, enable, you know, technology to, to be brought in at zero, you know, import duty if it is, if it is uh, things to do with, uh, with machinery equipment, all these go towards the cost of having such uh, an, an initiative in place. And that goes further to the final consumer who will be the, the, the commuter in this case. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Thank you for those answers, answering the question. Um, and next, I'm going to allow engineer Oscar Olaro to speak. Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I'm, I'm excited. I'm based in Google here and uh, I like what the border work people are, are doing. Um, a, a, a key issue here I'd like to find out. I, from my small research, I visited uh, a bajaj that makes motorcycle, assembled motorcycles in Kampala. When I asked about uh, the, the electric uh, bikes that are coming up, and the, the, the answer was like the, the issue here is that um, the public, the, the motorcycle industry is basically about uh, border border. And to make uh, the electrics, uh, the, and the fact that the motorcycles can easily be assembled anywhere and fuel can be got anywhere is an incentive. The apparent company in, uh, in uh, India already producing motorcycles. And they, for them as a company in Uganda, they don't see it feasible for them to invest in this area. And uh, my question is, uh, what, what, uh, what is Bodavar going to do about that? Because I believe that um, the mindset of the people should actually be tackled in one way or another. To make, uh, to make us believe that actually it's for the environment, for our own goods, for our own safety that we move towards uh, the electric, uh, the electric, the electric motor. Um, then I'm based here in North, the, the purchasing power of the, of, 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 of the people might not be as good. 
So I don't know, you already mentioned that you're working with financial institutions. That would be a very good thing. And I don't know if there are any incentives already with some banks we can work with uh, to, to, to pursue that, that direction. Uh, for the electric, for the Kayola people, personally, I'm excited about uh, what you're doing. And I would love to see that coming a little before um, being expanded, especially out of, uh, for long, for long, um, for long routes. Take an example, Kampala to Gulu, if you have some charging points at point A, point B, would be something appealing to many people. You're only fortunate that you're a government institution. So that should, the market is going to be sh sure deal. And like uh, our people at Border of Rack, whereby the market is not a sure deal. So um, um, I guess that's just a basic comment. And uh, I just want to thank you guys for, for the great work. But I'm keen on working with the Border of Rack because um, I have a base in Google here. I'm really doing manufacturing and I have, I have a, a ample space and I'm excited. I personally want to buy a, a bike from you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interest, uh, Mr. Aldaro, um, and your kind comments. Um, let me try to answer your question. So initially, yes, Bajaj, a very much Indian-based manufacturer. Uh, I should just clarify, though, that um, they actually have their vehicles produced under license in India. And actually, uh, there are all sorts of different frame and other part manufacturers that end up delivering to Uganda. So um, assembling parts here, basically, you can, how should I say, uh, there's a plethora of different suppliers of the same spare parts, essentially, that um, go together to assemble one vehicle. Um, so we, uh, in, in the market, we don't see ourselves as, you know, the next OEM. We, we don't want to, or we don't perceive ourselves as the next Yamaha or Honda. Um, we understand that these brands, for example, also have an interest in the market here. Um, we see ourselves as a local technology developer and provider, which means that if, uh, if Honda and uh, Yamaha, for example, had any interest in using our batteries or having us as a development partner on ground, then we would be thrilled. Um, we do see, though, that uh, until uh, such a partnership basically is fully established, um, we basically leverage existing infrastructure. And as you said, basically, as the gentleman from the judge said, uh, you you have a lot of work to do basically to make sure that a vehicle and its spare parts basically are abundant all over um, the country and I agree with him and that's precisely why we're looking to leverage that sort of standardized vehicle set in parts essentially that is already moving around the country. So um, it's one less hurdle you have to overcome basically to, to avail people with e-mobility and the beauty is basically when people look at a Bajaj and the engine is gone, they only worry is the engine in terms of costs. The other, the rest of the vehicle use typically works very well for them. It's the, the engine that typically is dies first. So um, it's an interesting concept, you know, when you see the same vehicle and actually only, you know, one part of it is uh, is different. <laughs> yes. Um, so so much for acceptance. Now, uh, why would you accept it in the end? And overall, the the promise of, of overall lower cost of operation. Of course, is, is what will what will lead you um, or finally convince you is if you can earn more money daily uh, based on the fact that you're spending less. That's your best opportunity. Then finally, um, the 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 prices, of course. Um, right now, you must understand we're at a small production capacity, uh, so these are the prices that we can avail right now. But uh, there is scale to to um, become cheaper, and yes, certainly financing options will also uh, be a requirement. Yes. I think I can pass on to Adam. Yes, thank you, Engineer Olaro. Uh, indeed, uh, charging infrastructure is critical for a bigger uptake of electric vehicles beyond urban, urban centers. And uh, recently, Total rebranded Total, Total Energies. And this was not really accidental. They, they're already positioning themselves to see how they can continue to be the, the uh, first recon within this space. So charging infrastructure, the way we see it as Kira Motors Corporation is a collaborative affair with also uh, attraction of investment by private sector. So it does not have Kira Motors that would even provide the chargers. This is an opportunity for if Dr. Olaro would want to start a charging station to support both border work and Kira Motors Corporation, and other electric vehicles that would come onto the market. That's an opportunity, and that's an opportunity to invest in as private sector. 
as we also support on the technology side uh, to also the, provide the device, just like Shell, Total, are offering fuel for diesel and petrol, petrol cars. It's the same scenario, really, uh, an opportunity for investment. Thank you. Thank you. This is brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, thank you, Engineer Olaro and our speakers. Thank you. Brilliant stuff. Mm -hmm. I will pass on. We have more questions, a few more questions. So Andrea Zonta, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, maybe I'll move on. Um, Rana, would you like? Go ahead. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Alan. Yeah. Uh, myself, Rana. Yes, I'm speaking from United Kingdom. So thank you very much. Your presentations are quite impressive and your work are appreciated my i have a bit particular questions for alan uh, regarding the koila ev bus so especially like i was a bit impressed when you are saying you know when you said that it's like a 5000 buses capacity per year so uh, what kind of chassis you are uh, doing in this uh, ev bus Okay, I can respond to that, I think. So I bring a frame chassis for, for EV buses. Uh, sorry, it's not bit, uh, would you please repeat one more time? Mm -hmm. A frame, frame chassis. Frame chassis, it's not monocoque, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and is there something like, uh, are you using any automated uh, process when you are manufacturing, when you are targeted to manufacture like 5,000 buses capacity per year? So, so currently the process is majorly manual. So we have physical human resource that is doing this. So it's welding, the welding is happening by an individual. If it is uh, painting, the painting is being done by an individual. It's quality control, it's all being done by an, an individual. So we would want uh, to minimize on, uh, of course, also helps to create more jobs. Uh, but as we also expand in some areas like where it might create risk, like in electrophoresis, electrocoating, where maybe dealing with chemicals that might be harmful, they are as well might employ some uh, automation. Thank you. Is the same chassis also applicable for a diesel bus? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that because, you know, uh, when you do manual, there will be you know, a lot of employment. But the thing is... <clears throat> the cost whether it is a cost efficient like because you know uh, you know you know you also know a bit more information uh, regarding the prices of the electrical buses from different sources like different countries mm -hmm. so hope the bus what you people are producing is it also compatible like you know economy wise when you are doing manual this kind of stuff yes i can i can guarantee that this is I think the other, the other aspect of, of the bus is that unlike, for example, if you build an SUV, it's the same model all throughout. But a bus, there are levels of customization where a specific user might require a specific kind of bus. So there are some areas where automation might not play because you need to do continual modifications to the entire automation process, which might even be more costly compared to if you're to have the process money and you can easily adjust based on what the user requirements are. Yeah, I do accept like, you know, it depends on the market, like there, there will be definitely, you know, some kind of modifications. Mm -hmm. So particularly like uh, when we are going for, especially premium kind of markets, is there any kind of uh, like, you know, target or is there any kind of thought you people are having when you are doing this uh, EV bus, like uh, premium, uh, like, you know, some kind of markets like uh, Europe, UK, uh, to do an export type of, uh, like an you know, export type of option? 
Yeah, in the long term, that is our target, but currently we are focusing on the East African region and diversify that to Africa and then the rest of the world as we also inc increase and wrap up on our production capacity. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan. Like, you know, uh, I will contact from LinkedIn, you know, to get your mail ID or you can just drop me your mail ID so that, you know, in further, uh, like further communication and, you know, a bit more interaction, uh, we have, uh, I think it will be required because I have some kind of, Thanks. like, you know, idea or like, you know, doing this financial institution supporting uh, for the business. Yeah. Is, is that right, clear? I'll, I'll drop you my, my email address, Rana. Thank you yes, very much. Is. Yeah. Have Pleasure. a good day. Bye. Thank you again for the questions. I think maybe I'll ask one more question from the chat box that hasn't been answered. And if anyone else has a further question, if you'd like to raise your hand, please do as I ask this question and then we'll come to a close soon. Um, but I guess another question is, and this is directed to Alan, whether there is any kind of scope for smaller vehicles um, as opposed to, I guess, the larger bus that could be also made in Kampala and maybe, and this question is from Timothy. And I think my addition to that question is also um, the kind of matatus and the buses that you have kind of described as eight of them can be replaced by the one electrical bus. What happens to these buses? Can, is there also um, scope for them? Has this been thought about in kind of your strategy for developing buses? Yeah, thank you. Um... We have, we, we have plans to also build sedans, SUVs and pickups. Um, that, that is where we will build our facility in Kayunga, which currently we are doing an investment plan, a five-year investment plan for, to help us to arrive at what the most feasible way forward would be. Also looking at what parts manufacturers and suppliers you can attract to support that. But for the start, um, our market entry product will be buses and trucks. But we'll also be offering contract manufacturing for vehicle manufacturers. So if Mitsubishi, instead of selling its L200, one of its popular pickups, uh, fully built and imports it, we can uh, offer them manufacturing services as a service to them for that L200, to help them to reduce on their cost and, and give them a better bottom line. Uh, so those are also opportunities for revenue generation. But in the long term, we will be also making the passenger, if I could call them private vehicles, outside buses. Uh, for, the, for the matatus, interestingly, the matatus are not designed for public transport. Uh, typically, they're designed for cargo. But when we bring them here, we convert them and put seats that are not very well engineered, uh, which sometimes can be a threat to, to the commuters. And what, so what we're trying to do is how do we have a device that is fit for city mobility? Because if you're within the central business district, the frequency of travel is high. So to meet that demand, because we're looking at about 1.5 million daily commuters to the city. If you have matatus, you'll have a number of them leading to congestion and, uh, and sustainability. But if you have buses, then you have fuel on the road is on congestion. Now the matatus are, would be best on the on the second and last mile in the outskirts of the city to uh, to, to to take off because if you're if you're doing those feeder roads to the where the people are staying, the bus might not be feasible economically. So that's where the matatu would come in. And and the the collaboration we're having with Tondeka Metro Rentco Africa is to help to also have a, a, a an intervention such that the matatus can be in those areas and we help them to also earn more money through integration with the payment system that we are generating such that it's a handoff that is seamless. You know, like in telecos where you hand off from one, uh, from one tower to the other, you don't even realize it. So that's the kind of approach you want to do so that we can create more opportunity to the areas where they can actually then make uh, more returns because yeah, there's less traffic. They're not, they're not losing time in, uh, in jam, but they are constantly moving and earning money in the process. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I think there's, I'll just ask, I'll allow Emmanuel 
Kagogo. <laughs> Sorry, to say to ask his final to ask a final question, and then we'll close after this. Okay, I've lost him. So I think I think that's okay. I think we can close here. There still are questions to be answered, but maybe we can follow up with some of this information later on in the newsletter. Um, thank you very much to both speakers. Uh, I think maybe if Alan Samakula, if he would like to say, if he has anything final he'd like to say, he. Alan, you're welcome now. Otherwise, I will just I'll close. Give him a second. I think that's fine. Um, so yeah, thank you for to everyone, to all our attendees for joining this uh, discussion on e-mobility. And I'm sure you have learned a lot uh, from this conversation that has really just begun. And it would be great to see it continue. I think. Um, already throughout the event, um, contacts are being shared and we will share contacts and more information, the presentations as well with the entire audience so that you are all able to access this information. Um, but I guess the idea for Local Talks is that we start uh, topics here, but we continue to speak about them as we all are interested in green design and seeing um, the green, greener cities around us closer to home. Um, so. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to our speakers, um, Alan Muhumuza and Janos Bisasso. Thank you for representing uh, your companies and sharing with us today. Um, as a reminder, just one final reminder to everyone, this has been recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube. So you're welcome to follow up from there. And Local Talks will is continuing. We have a talk every third Wednesday of every third month. So I hope to see many of you join us again. And everyone is welcome to get in touch if you have topics that you are interested in us um, speaking about or bringing speakers to talk about, or if you yourself have a expertise that you would like to share, please do get in touch and with us. We'd really love to hear from as many people as possible. But I think that's it for now. Um, have a good night, everyone. And thank you for joining us again. And thank you to our speakers <laughs> for your time. Thank you, Randy. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 All right. We shall be touched. All right. Cheers. <laughs>